All right, yeah, go ahead. All right, so the password for our machine is just five zeros. So I'll just do OK and OK. So everything's on now. Usually when you first come in, you're going to want to have the oven turn on and have the pump start. So when you start up an HPLC, you want to make sure the column is going to be flush and that the oven is up to temperature. For this column that we're using here, um, we're using this bottle here. So we have all these different solvents, right? We have A, B, C, and D, and then we have a wash solution. For this column, we can just use one uh, uh, mobile phase. So the liquid is called the mobile phase. It goes through the column. In this case, it's very dilute sulfuric acid, so this is 0.005 normal, not molar, normal sulfuric acid. Um, and so that gets pumped through the column. The column is in here. Um, this machine actually has a heated column, so we're able to heat this up. Uh, the pumps will, the high pressure pumps will pump from that tube D, it goes around, it goes into this tube, and the flow direction of this HPLC is up. So this column that's in here is a ROA organic acid H plus column. So this column is made for sugar and organic acid analysis. So if you're doing anything with sugars or, or acids, this column's great, especially since you only need one mobile phase. So columns um, have a few different parameters. So here's a really small column. This is like a 50 millimeter column. Yep, 50 millimeter. And then there's really, really big columns too and, and, and everything in between. So usually you have three measurements. You have the length of the column, you have the diameter of the column, and you have the particle size within the column. And then another parameter that you'll need to know for every column is the material of the particles in the column. So. This one has five micrometer uh, beads inside, and it's a 250 millimeter long, so 25 centimeter long column, 10 millimeter in diameter, um, and so those are the dimensions. And this one happens to be a C18 column. And then this one here is also a C18 column, but it's 1.9 micrometer particle size, 50 millimeters long, and 2.1 millimeters in diameter, and that's the inner diameter of the column. So in addition to the column, you also need like a pre-filter here. So this is, a, this is another column that has a pre-filter. Every pre-filter is built for the column that you're running, so you can't just use any pre-filter on any column. Um, here, this is our pre-filter, and recently I had, had to actually change the filter puck in there, a lot of times these pre-filters are serviceable and you can take them apart and just put a new filter puck in. So as the fluid comes in, you want to make sure there's no chunks or debris or anything that get in your column and clog it up. Clog it up. So the way that the column in an HPLC works is you have a particular material in there and that material is going to have different affinity to different chemicals. So say for example, we have a mixture of uh, glucose and sucrose going through this column. This column is going to attract the glucose and sucrose at different levels. So the glucose maybe sticks to the column more and the sucrose sticks to the column less. So the glucose will sort of move slowly through the column and the sucrose will move a little faster through the column. And so once all of the chemicals are separated, it comes up here and it goes into here and uh, there's a detector. So this is an HPLC, so it's just going to have a um, absorbance detector or refractance detector or something like that. But you can also hook up the liquid chromatography setup to a gas chromatograph if you want to and that can, um, you know, explode the molecules apart and get definitive amounts of, uh, or definitively find what chemicals are, are in that mixture. But this is just going to give you a spectrum, basically. Our particular HPLC is set up with a photodiode array, or a PDA, 
which allows you to look at every wavelength between 200 and 800 nanometers. So I'll show you what that data looks like. Um, so this is a spectrogram here. And as you run the, the sample through the column, you know, you're going to be measuring time on the x-axis here. And then on one of the axes, you can measure intensity of the light being um, blocked or absorbed. And on the other axis, you can measure the wavelength. So this is actually a, a three-axis graph, but um, it's just a heat map. The, the third axis is just a heat map. Mm -hmm. So what we can do is take a slice of this graph at a particular wavelength and look at the peaks in that graph. So again, we have time on the x-axis here. So like at two and a half minutes, this is happening. At, you know, 12 minutes, this is happening. And we have the wavelength, so we can look at any wavelength we want. Normally things like sugars and organic acids are going to be you know, around this 200 to 250 uh, nanometer range. Um, in this case, this big blob here is uh, acetate or acetic acid. So if we move this cursor here, we look at different cross sections of this 3D spectrogram, right? Um, so we're changing the wavelength here, so we can move this down. Mm -hmm. We can also use these errors to move up and down. And so we're looking at this two-dimensional cross-section of this 3D graph, and that's what we see down here. So you can see as we move this, it changes the graph down here. So uh, acetate, the protocol that I'm using, recommends measuring at 210 nanometers. Of course, you can see it at you know 200 and a bunch of other different wavelengths too. But as long as you're consistent, um, you know, your measurements are going to be accurate. Mm. So here we have time on the x-axis and intensity on the y-axis. So as the chemicals go through, they generate this peak. So you can see this, this peak represents some chemical. I don't even know what the chemical is, but it's something. This peak represents another chemical, and this peak, I'm 99% sure, is acetate or acetic acid, basically vinegar. And then this final area down here is showing um, the area under these peaks. So this is just calculus. This is um, not super difficult math. Just the area under the peak is going to be directly proportional to the amount of chemical in the solution, right? So what you can do is generate a calibration curve. So you can have, um, I don't know if I have the samples. I don't have the samples in here. I should have them here. So what I did is I took, you know, a um, hundred millimolar or a hundred micromolar acetate, five hundred micromolar acetate, a thousand micromolar acetate, measured them all in the HPLC. I got these areas, and then I generated this graph, and you can see it's perfectly straight. This means that the area under the peak is linearly proportional or directly proportional to the concentration of the chemical in the solution, right? And we get an R-squared value of 1, which basically means it, it perfectly fits the data. Um, for this particular set of data, it's a little bit off on the, on the low end of things, just because the peaks get really small and a little noisier. Mm -hmm. um, so you kind of need to find the range where the detection method is um, uh, most accurate, I guess, right? Um, okay, so if you're testing for a new chemical, you should go online, try to find a method. It's, it's called a method for whatever chemical you want to test. Find out what wavelength you should be looking at to find that chemical, um, and uh, find out what mobile phase you should use, what column you should use. In this case, if you're doing sugars, this column is fine. The method that I have is fine. Just get a pure sample of your chemical, whatever sugar you want to test for, run it through the column, and watch for a very clear peak coming off. So, for example, this one um, should have a mostly clear peak. So this is just the media. This is the acetate media that I used. Mm -hmm. And I had to dilute it 20 times in order to get you know a clear peak. But 
There's a couple other things in the media that are coming off on this column, but mainly we just see acetate, a very clear baseline, and then a huge peak for acetate. Um, so what I was doing is measuring the acetate depleting in my media over time. And what that looks like is this here. So these are, this is one strain. This is the time point with three replicates. I put in the area and I put in the formula to calculate the amount of acetate in micromolars. And I also have a dilution factor that I used. And so finally we can calculate how much acetate is in the media. So in this media, I started with 500 millimolar acetate, and you can see it's at like 460 at 48 hours, and then by 96 hours, it's around 390, and then at 120 hours, it's around 360. So the acetate's going down over time. So that's something that you can do with HPLC. So I sort of went backwards on this. This is how the data analysis works. Um, you can go in these folders and find where your data is. You're welcome to save it in my folder if you want to or make your own. But actually running the machine, like I showed, you can turn the pumps and the oven on over here. Um, and you can also turn them on and off here in this software. So you have two tabs here. One is the real-time analysis. That's where we actually um, control the machine and set up the batches. And then the post-run analysis is where we look at our data. So we're in the real-time analysis page, so I can turn the pump back on, I can turn the oven on or off, whatever I want to do. I can purge or rinse the machine if I want to. Um, if you end up needing to use a different method file, you can do file, open method file, and open the method you want. Um, just so you know where mine is, if you go into, just so you see this, so you know where to go, but it's in lab OSC, Lab Solutions Data, NIC, acetate um, actually it's just uh, under Nick there's acetate 2 acetate 2 is the method you want to use you open it was already open but um, I'll show how this works so I pressed open and it pulls up the whole method file you can look at it if you want and then you just say download and I don't know why it says download and but that's just how it is um, so the method parameters, again, this is just one mobile phase. This is a really simple method file. We, the only thing we can control is the flow rate, right? So, and this is even easier because we're just going to have a constant flow rate of 0.8 milliliters per minute. And we can control the oven temperature. That's about it. Oftentimes you'll have two mobile phases or two solvents that you use. Mm -hmm. And you can vary the concentrations of those, and that will push different chemicals off the column depending on the ratios of those chemicals. So usually you use a polar and a nonpolar solvent like water and acetonitrile or water and methanol. Um, and depending on the polarity of the mobile phase that you're pushing through, different chemicals will come off of the column. Okay, so right now we're in the data acquisition tab. We can also go to the batch editor. So this will allow us to set up a, what's called a batch file. So the batch file is what's going to run um, the different uh, tubes in the machine. So these trays right here hold the samples. So this tray right here is A1. This is tray 1. This is tray 2. All of these we can throw away. Um, these are somebody's old samples and there's basically nothing in there trying to find one that we can test out. Yeah, these are all basically empty. So we'll need to throw these away, but um, when you want to run your samples, these are glass files. We have them in 262 if you, if you need them. But um, you need to sterile filter your samples into those glass files because you don't want any particles going through the machine. There is the pre-filter, but you should still filter your samples all the time. Okay. So you sterile filter your samples, put them in here. There's, you know, uh, what are they called? Vial numbers. And then this is tray one. Um, and so you can go in here. And again, I'm on the batch editor tab. I can do file, open batch file, and then I can, you know, 
go through anywhere you want, but again, it's the same area, OSC, Lab Solutions, Data, Nick, and then um, you can open one of mine just to see as a template. So the only things that you need to change are the tray names. So it's one, I always just use tray one, the vial number, and that's gonna be where your sample is, the sample name, and then the uh, method file, which you should just use my method, so that should be the same, and the data file. And the data file has to have this .lcd at the end. So in order to, and you can, if you want to, you can change, um, you can change the injection volume. So I have it set to five microliters, and I think five microliters is pretty standard and pretty safe. Uh, so to make it easier to enter the um, stuff for the HPLC, um, you can use this template that I have here. So here is gonna be the, the vial number. This is gonna, these, oops. These three uh, columns are going to be, you know, whatever you want, basically, and then this column will concatenate these three things so that you get the sample name, and then this column concatenates the sample name with .lcd so that you get the file name that you want to save it as. So you just enter in any parameters that you have here, and it will concatenate them for you, and then you can copy them and paste them into the batch editor, just so it's easier. You can always come here and do delete row or insert row or add row or copy row if you want to add things. Um, and once you want to run your file, you do Q batch run. I'm not going to, well, you should save your batch file first. So file, save batch file as. Um, and then you can do Q batch run and it will put it in the queue. And if there's nothing in the queue like there is right now, it will just run the batch file starting at the top. Um, <clears throat> you can always look at the batch queue right here. So say for example you come in, you just want to get the thing started, you could just set up a batch file with one thing, run it, and while that one's running you can set up your other batch files if you want. Or if you have a bunch of things to prepare, you can start a few of them and then you know add things to the queue. But usually what ends up happening is you have a batch file that's going to take like seven hours. So what you have to do if you have a long batch file that you're not going to be able to come in and check on right when it finishes is you should press shut down. And what that does, if you press OK, leave all this how it is. If you press OK, it will put that in the queue, in the batch file queue. So even though you have your batch file running, this is going to be scary, you have your batch file running, you can still just press shut down and it will queue up the shutdown. It won't shut it down immediately. So you'll be able to go into the batch queue and see your batch is running right now, and then you'll see a shutdown queued up, ready to go um, for right when it ends. And that's important because you're going to run out of solvent eventually, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you don't want to waste solvent either. In this case, it's just water and sulfuric acid, so it isn't expensive. But you, know, you have your waste container here, so that's something you have to maintain. Um, and then the other thing is if you run out of solvent, then you start pumping air into the lines. Do not get air in the lines. It's a pain to get air out of the column. Um, yeah, purge it out. Purge it out, it's, it's, it's a huge pain. Um, so you have to keep that topped off. I'm actually gonna turn off the pump in the oven since we aren't gonna run anything today. Um, but you actually see, um, so that's basically how to run everything in this method file, each each run is 17.6 minutes, so that's just something to keep in mind. We're running at a flow rate of 0.8 milliliters per minute, um, which I think if you do the math, you should be able to run, if you just have a one liter bottle up there, you should be able to run this machine for like 24 hours or something, 20 hours. You can do the math, um, but you just wanna make sure you never really run out of that solvent, again, because you'll get air in the lines. Um, so the pump is on right now. So, you know, that's how you run everything. Uh, just a couple of maintenance things, I guess, now is with the pump running, you can see we're at 6.4 megapascals. If I turn the pump off on the computer, it drops down. Um, so 
with this column, it should be running around six to 10 megapascals. Um, I was running it for several days recently and I ended up clogging the pre-filter and so it got up to like 25 megapascals and at that pressure, it just automatically shuts off. Um, it will throw an error code. So I, I've set in this method file that if it gets up to like 26 or 27 megapascals, it should just shut off because I don't, because the higher pressure is a higher burden on the pumps that are mm -hmm. down here. These are the pumps, by the way. Um, so if you see the pressure rising, that's probably because the pre-filter or the column is clogged and it needs to be replaced. Um, if you see in your data that it's like very noisy, so this is a very nice flat line. Here, let's, here's a water sample. So you see the scale is like just negative one. Usually the scale goes to like 20 or something. This should just be water. And you see there's still noise in there. Not that much, but there's still noise. If there's an air bubble trapped in there, it will be really, really noisy and chaotic and just an absolute mess. Um, which reminds me, when you set up method files, you should, it's best practice, to start with a blank sample. So if your uh, samples are in water, it would be water. If it's in acetonitrile, it'd be acetonitrile, just pure acetonitrile. Um, start your batch file with a blank, end your batch file with a blank. You should probably also start and end your batch files with a known standard just to be sure. And if you have a really long batch file, you might want to put more standards in there so that you know you're using the same number every time. If you want to be really meticulous. Um, so, I think that's everything. Um, so when you're done, you can just press the power button and it turns